Marilyn, um, you may go ahead. Hello. I'm Marilyn Sigmund, an educator for Alaska Sea Grant, an instructor in the University of Alaska Fairbanks course, teaching about Alaska seas and watersheds. Uh, it's a course for K through 12 educators, and this webinar is part of that course. The focus today is gonna be on, oops, no, I'm sorry. The focus will be on the grade four unit of Alaska seas and watersheds curriculum. Can you go back one, please? The case of the mis uh, missing sea otter. Like all seas and watersheds units, it's organized around an overarching understanding, which you see here is an ecological one about ecological connections, and also around a small number of essential questions that are related both to scientific concepts of interdependence and, and the definition of an ecosystem, and also the practice of science. Next, please. The unit uses a real Alaska science mystery to engage students, that of a surprising and drastic decline in sea otter populations in the Aleutian Islands. One of the first science concepts in the unit is that of food chains and food webs. Uh, in relation to the possible cause of the sea otter decline, students learn about research on the food chain you see highlighted here in pink, from kelp to sea urchins to sea otters, and later they learn about research into the possible role of killer whales in that food chain, also highlighted in pink. But since we developed this unit in 2009, some important and interesting sea otter research has been done in Kachemak Bay in Southeast Alaska. This research has focused on the interactions of sea otters with the prey species you see highlighted in yellow, sea urchins, mussels, clams, and fish. Different ecological stories are emerging that we wanted to share with you. In addition, as sea otter populations have grown and expanded in those areas, otters and people have come into conflict over those same species. The food web is inaccurate right now for those other areas because it doesn't include people. Next, please. This illustration of the Gulf of Alaska ecosystem shows the many ways people are engaged in harvesting from the marine ecosystem, commercially, recreationally, and, and for subsistence, and how our other activities influence the coastal marine ecosystem in many ways. So another purpose of this webinar is to provide you more information about some of the issues related to sea otters and humans, which you could then use to engage your students in critical thinking and problem solving. Next, please. Finally, after you've heard more about recent research and issues, Beth Frobridge, the other instructor of this course and I, will provide some tips about how to use what you've heard along with other resources in the curriculum so you can adapt to your teaching situation, such as teaching at different grade levels or aligning your teaching with the next, the new next generation science standards. Hello, my name is Kathy Rezebeck. I am the facilitator uh, for this webinar. And um, above at the top of this screen, you will see some webinar tips. Um, we are not using chat today, and when you are not speaking, please turn your mute off. Uh, today's agenda um, includes a variety of people. You've just heard from Marilyn Sigmund. And after I am finished here with this slide, Angela Doroff will begin a presentation about sea otter natural history and more, um, followed by Sunny Rice, Sea Otters and Modern Humans in Southeast Alaska. Um, we will have a Q&A, followed by Beth Trowbridge, Teaching Applications and Resources, and then Marilyn Sigmund will close the, the webinar um, in about 60 minutes. With that, I'd like to uh, turn to um, Angela Doroff, and we'll go ahead and move into her section of this program. Go ahead, Angie. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Angela Doroff, and I work at the Ketchumac Bay Research Reserve. Prior to that, I've been spent, oh gosh, since the mid 80s, which does date me, working on sea otters in Alaska and California. One of the things I do in my volunteer time now is work with the IUCN Otter Specialist Group and represent sea otters on that uh, Otter Specialist Group for North America and Asia. So that flavors a little bit of the presentation I'll give today. And given that, next slide please. I'm gonna, this is a very dated map, but it's a good one. So it's an oldie, but a goodie. Um, and it shows the complete range of the sea otter globally, um, going down to Baja, Mexico in the lower uh, right corner, all the way through Northern Hokkaido in Japan to the left. What 
the thing I'd like you to see here is that each of these little ticks are a place where there was a remnant population. Sea otters were nearly extirpated in the commercial fur trades, and I'll talk a little bit about that more later. Um, but each of these little ticks is where there were actually a few sea otters remaining. From these 11 groups, there's 13 shown here, 11 of these groups repopulated the sea otter range as we know it today, along with some um, very targeted translocations by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. So more about that later. Next slide. So where you know, we think we came from something like oh probably less than three thousand animals worldwide widely dispersed across that whole range I just showed you to a sea otter population estimate globally of about one hundred and twenty six thousand. The, the range is still the range of the species. However, given the significant population declines in the Aleutian Archipelago, um, Alaska Peninsula region, and the troubled recovery of the southern sea otters, the, those are two ESA listed species in the United States, and you can see that over 75% of the world population is in the United States. That has pushed this into a, a threatened species status under the IUCN Red List. Next, please. Some of the conservation issues that are talked about globally is this genetic bottleneck. So, for example, the California population was down to maybe only 40 animals in its recovery. Um, less than a couple hundred in each of the Alaska and Russia population um, recovery units, if you want to call them that. So that was a very small uh, bottleneck for the species to go through. We've demonstrated through the Exxon Valdez that they're extremely vulnerable to oil spills. They're extremely uh, vulnerable to major overharvest. We saw that in the commercial fur trades, and most recently to predation with the Aleutian um, archipelago declines. New and kind of emerging issues for this species are some of the climate change stressors. Uh, increase in marine storms that separate um, adults from their pups, emerging diseases. We've um, discovered foci to distemper from uh, coming over the Arctic in, in sea otters in Alaska. Um, and the ones that we know a little bit less about and are putting some effort to understand are how ocean acidification is interacting, may interact with their prey resources, and how the pre uh, prevalence of biotoxin events is interacting with their ability to uh, eat um, shellfish. Next, please. So I, I'm putting this in here be, just mostly because I'm, uh, this is where I'm from right now, and um, habitat and history is pretty much the same, you know, for these animals everywhere. We've removed them from a large uh, portion of their range, and what we know about sea otters is that recovery pattern, them moving back into habitat that they've been hunted out of for a long time. So the Lower Cook Inlet and Catch Mac Bay example, um, very systematic harvest, completely extirpated by 1792. A very short time frame, just under 12,000 pelts were documented to be leaving this area, this, this, this uh, footprint. Um, and then almost 200 years of no sea otters in the system. Next, please. So what we have by ADF and G records is sea otters returning to this area in the mid 70s, not in very many numbers. Um, by 1994, there was enough, you know, just under a thousand animals where they're starting to resume that role, the ecological role as a, a keystone species in the habitat. And since then, a steady growth um, and some and fairly high birth rates. Um, the we estimate about a 13 point, gosh, well, roughly a 13% rate of increase per year um, of natural recolonization and then some immigration to this region. The last population estimate was about 6,000 for Kachemak Bay. And so I, I wanted to just say that because so much of what we know about sea otters is this pattern of recolonization, stabilization, coming to e equilibrium density with its habitat. Next, please. So I'm going to shift a little bit and give you some background about evolution, morphology, and behavior, mostly just because it's fun. <laughs> so um, next, please. C 
sea otters are sitting here with the cetaceans and the sirenia. They're um, not a very good marine mammal. They are one, but they're not a very good one, and I'll get into that. So there they are sitting with the seals and walrus and sea lions. Next, please. And so sea otters are um, an order carnivora, a family mustelid. And then we get into, next slide, please where they fit you know so they're really the only marine mammal of all 13 species worldwide of otters the only one that comes close is the marine otter in south america it doesn't really have the, the adaptations to forage and live in entirely marine existence so it will forage in the ocean come out and actually go through a bit of a torpor as it's digesting food and then the rest of its life is on land sea otters can be entirely pelagic and that makes them a unique in the otter world and for a whole bunch of reasons I'll go on to tell you a very odd marine mammal. Next please. So here, here's a North American river otter. We think that sea otters have come from Asia about somewhere about three million years ago <laughs> and they've had some adaptations. Next please. That that allow them to live. So here's some of the physical ones. Uh, the animal on the right is a, a North American river otter and then a sea otter and then a skeleton of a sea otter. Um, there, uh, next please, I think I won't dwell on that too much. Um, skull morphology, river otters are adapted to catching fish. They have very sharp pointed teeth. They have a very fast movement pattern. So the otters are, have these flattened molars. They're built for crushing and breaking into shelled prey, shelled invertebrate prey. They don't need to be necessarily fast swimmers like a river otter. Next please. Um, some modifications of the feet. So these mitten-like forepaws have retractable claws like a cat. They're very dexterous and they're used for uh, acquiring prey when they dive and manipulating prey at the bottom, um, digging, um, moving rocks. Those claws are also used in grooming and, and reorganizing fur and I'll talk about that in a bit. And then the to the right are the modified hind limbs, the flippers for swimming and oftentimes they're swimming on their back. They've got a very unique rotation of the, the femur and um, not exclusively swimmings on their back, but much of the time. I think that's all I'll say about that. Next slide, please. So the upper left image there is a sea otter doing what I call a sculling motion. It's eating, it's got its prey on the surface and it's using its tail to, to move in, in, in slight uh, motions with its flipper. The animal below is a territorial male and it's swimming on its belly. We kind of call that sort of its um, patrolling behavior. <laughs> it's moving around its territory and seeing who's who and um, that's very often they'll, they'll adopt that swimming posture when they're doing it. So the others are very awkward on land. You can see these uh, photographs, they almost are raccoon-like. They've got this very humped. They can move quite quickly, but for very short periods of time on land. Their femurs are very short. They're laterally set in the hip socket, which allows them to do that swimming motion, but really compromises them when they're on the land. That said, they are very good swimmers. I mean, they can swim up to 40 kilometers a day when motivated to do so. Um, but they're very awkward on land, unlike their river otter cousins. Next, please. This is just a little bit about their ears. Um, we don't know much about sea otter auditory capability. What we think we know about their eyesight is pretty average for a, a mammal their size. They have a very keen sense of smell, so you'll see them periscoping up and going downwind of whatever it is they're interested in. Um, they have well-developed verbisci, um, and what else? And uh, uh, nose scars, um, mating injuries are across the nose pad as the male grabs the female during mating and sometimes you'll see quite uh, pronounced scars on the nose pad. Next please. So I talked about adaptations to being a marine mammal and this is my best uh, image of, um, this is a female carrying a very small pup. This pup is still completely dependent on its mom. It has extra thick fur and those rivulets you see as water's uh, pouring off of it 
are because it has long guard hairs. Sea otters use their fur for thermal installation against the cold water. They don't have a blubber layer like other marine mammals have to adapt to be in this cold water. They use this very specialized fur. That pup is uh, very small. It cannot dive because it's too buoyant. There's too much thick, for, you know, well-groomed, aerated fur. The female, you can also see, uh, you know, she's shedding water across her guard hairs too, but the, the, uh, um, the type of fur, you know, it's, it's, it's a little more compact and she's able to dive. It's that air into the fur helps protect it from the cold. Hair density ranges somewhere from 26,000 to 164,000 per cubic centimeter. This is part of the why, reason why these animals were hunted to near extinction. Next, please. So this is just another kind of um, macroscopic, microscopic, I'm sorry, view of it. The image to the right is the downy fur, and then the long spiky ones are the guard hairs. In the image to the left, you can see the thick guard hair each each fur uh, each um, follicle has a long guard hair associated with a small tuft of under fur. Okay, next please. And grooming. Um, because this is their insulation, they have no body fat. They spend a significant portion of their time grooming, and so the th primary activities you have for sea otters are. Foraging, resting, grooming, and if they're adult female, there's pup rearing involved, and some, you know, mating and patrolling for males. Um, sea otters have a, a metabolism that's about two to three times higher than that of a terrestrial animal of the of a similar size, and so that they need to eat a lot. So their two their two tools are one is their thick fur that's well groomed and eating the high metabolism. Next, please. So here we have some pictures of uh, sea otters doing what, what they do best, and that's eating. And they can eat up to 25% of their body weight per day. This was one of the reasons that they became, you know, apparent that this was one of the features that made it a keystone, keystone species, um, that because they structure the nearshore uh, habitat um, so intensively by their foraging. Um, Sea otters will specialize in different prey types. There's over 250 kinds of things sea otters will eat. Um, there's a lot of um, mother pup transit, uh, transference in foraging. And next slide, please. So sea otters can produce a pup any time of the year. The, it has its natal fur up to 13 weeks of a uh, of of their age, and you can see on the middle picture there, that's that natal fur. This pup can't dive yet. And then the very bottom image there is showing a pup that's old enough that started, it's replaced its pup pelage, it's got its adult fur, and it's now starting to dive with its, its mom. Because there is a lot to know about foraging and where different food is and how to get it, um, sea otters are very dependent on their mother and learning how to forage and forage successfully. So there's a longer dependency period. Twinning does happen for pups, but it's, it's, uh, we have yet to document a twin actually surviving just because of the energetic demands of raising a pup. Next, please. Uh, I think I covered much of this, but I will say that we talked about time activity budgets a little bit for this species. And in a food resources limited area, a, an otter will have to spend maybe 50 to 60 percent of the day providing food for herself and the pup. That's really a lot. That's a um, of a 24-hour day. That's that's a lot of effort going to to food. Um, and again, I think this photo series shows a you know completely dependent pup that's still nursing, a pup that maybe not dives independent yet, but is very interested in what's mom is bringing to the surface. And then the final one um, is a, a pup diving with mom and sharing an octopus. Next, please. Um, so a little bit about sea otters as habitat in engineers. We've got really sweet data from the Central Aleutians. A lot of Jim Estes and many of his students work on that. It's been a really um, 
wonderful way to engage about kelp forest and urchin and otter dynamics. And it's, I don't want to say it's a simpler uh, relationship, but it's a beautiful one because it works. <laughs> Much less is known about the dynamics and soft sediments and mixed substrate. And I just put this picture of this diving big male otter in because I love it and wanted to put it in there somewhere. I, um, next, please. So this may be familiar to some of you. So these are some of the photos from that um, central Aleutians area where sea otters are absent. You get these very dense beds of uh, green urchin and they're in very intense grazers on kelp forests. When sea otters are back in the system, you get these um, shifts to kelp uh, forest ecology. Next, please. Some of the graduate work that came out of that, we're looking at what happens when you have um, kelp forest abundance, and this was a rock greenling study um, done, it's a little while back, um, but you can see that once, once you have that kelp forest canopy and understory, it creates structure, and that in that structure you can host a variety of marine invertebrates, but also uh, uh, fish species. And this is from the Central and uh, Western Aleutians. Next, please. So in Kachemak Bay, we don't we do have some canopy canopy forming kelp, understory kelp, but most of what we have are these really intensely mixed substrates. And it's very um, there's a lot of things making a living off of the bivalves, which are the dominant prey here, including oyster catchers, um, sea stars. Um, clam worms, and then, of course, there's the researchers over in the corner. So, uh, next slide, please. Some of the tools we use for uh, investigating and or connecting sea otters and habitat or direct observation. In the photo here is Karen Corbell looking through a scope, doing visual focal animal sampling, visually looking at the prey and um, documenting it that way. Here we do um, some overwinter diet analysis by SCAT. Um, and Recently, we've done a fair bit of work collectively. Many of us have contributed to a larger research project on whisker isotope analyses. And then we have some indirect me metrics of looking at shell litter and interpreting it and some forage pits work. And I'll show some data from that. Next. So now I'm starting to drill into the home front here. This is Lower Cook Inlet, Kachemak Bay. And then um, to, in the, let's see, 2007 to 2010, we had 44 radio tagged sea otters in Kachemak Bay. This is a plot of just where they were foraging. You can see that they're using open water habitat pretty extensively because it's a shallow um, bay here. Um, we put a buffer around the one kilometer mark, which is kind of the distance you can use focal animal sampling from shore. So you can see we're missing a lot. The red dots are things we could get with that particular method. The blue ones are ones we couldn't. And then so that leaves, uh, you know, like how many tools do you use to be able to answer some of these questions? Um, we also plotted the um, uh, catch per unit for the uh, tanner crab fishery here. And it's just an overlay of where the crab are, where the otters are, where where our tools let us look at things. Next, please. And so for since 2008, we've been doing some work um, with some citizen science, of, uh, taking weekly collections of scat, looking at what's, what's being consumed. Um, up the upper uh, right image is the depositors of the scat, and um, Karen Corbell again, with she was one of our semester on the Bay students who was um, doing this as part of an internship, uh, Dave Seaman, who is part of the collection team, and then many students have helped along the way. Next, please. So this is just an example of one of the students' projects um, looking at not all things come through SCAT, and there's a lot of biases in working with this, but it does very well for um, urchin, mussel, and clam shells. And so we put together a guide of what, um, you know, how much crab do we see in the SCAT, and how do we identify it to species? Um, next, please. And some shell litter studies, gathering shells and um, looking at who's eating what. Um, the uh, image of the, uh, the shells in the small pan, the one with that very distinctive uh, crack of the ha one half of the shell is a very 
definitive otter cracking of the shell. These shells that are more open like this are more apt to be from sea star predation. And then the other two images I have are um, crabs eat a fair bit of clam and clam siphons as well. And you get this little bit of a characteristic crack across the siphon there. So we had all of those primarily. Uh, well, I'll show that in a moment. So next slide, please. So another student, Brent Stewart, that we worked with, um, did a whole work, whole lot of work with shell litter and um, live bivalve assemblages. And we just kind of took some sites that were known to be used by sea otters and, and not, they were available but not used by sea otters. And we used primarily Saxatomus, the butter clam. That's primarily what they're eating. Um, Let's see, what was I gonna say? Um, so you can see that in the in what was available, the otter crack shells, you know, were much a little bit higher in their size distribution than the live assemblages. And the used areas, those were much closer together. And so there's a dynamic, a patch dynamic on how sea otter foraging interfaces with the environment. There's a whole lot of digging going on out there and there's a, you know, different patchiness and how prey is used and we're just beginning to sort some of that out. Next slide, please. And this is looking at um, title and subtitle shell litter. And one of the questions that came up was about otter pits and are, are all the pits that you see in these soft sediment plates made by otters or other things and how do you know the difference? And the upper one says it's really messy. Um, sea otters will go in and dig a pit. Sea stars will come in and use the pit. Overwintering foraging sea ducks will use those pits. Currents and other things influence them. So we have a little trouble trying to sort that out. But the otter cracked are, and um, sea star preyed shell litter for Saxodomus was pretty interesting. These kind of look like moons. The, the white space is things that were preyed upon by sea stars, and the dark is by sea otter. And the five areas you see that are with numbers underneath them are showing the number of sites. We looked at five sites, and then the, the sample sizes for each of those. So there's a, you know, it's pretty dynamic between these two major predators in that near shore area. Next, please. So some of our next steps and and having a better understanding on how sea otters influence these soft or mixed sediment structures, we've got a project that we're looking at some deductive um, habitat modeling for bivalve prey. Um, prey is really um, significantly reduced throughout this whole south central region for bivalves, and there's probably a whole number of things contributing to that, um, including predation. And we're concerned about some of the environmental drivers like ocean acidification. And, and some of the toxicity in, you know, as a, a local food resources for biotoxins as well. So uh, one of the projects we're working with the Alutic Pride Shellfish Hatchery on is, is, you know, are we able to do some spawning gardens, increasing clam densities in small areas and monitoring how recruitment, what hinders a recruitment, what enhances recruitment. So those are some ongoing things for Ketchumac Bay out of Port Graham and Seldovia. And then, you know, our goal through our um, Gulf Watch project is to refine some of these habitat use patterns and ecosystem linkages. And I think that's all I have. And I'm happy to take questions if there's time. Thank you very much, Angie. Why don't we move on to uh, Sunny Rice? Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story um, in Southeast Alaska. But first, um, my name is Sunny Rice, and I work with Maryland for the Alaska Sea Grant Marine Advisory Program. We're part of the School of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and I'm based in Petersburg in central Southeast Alaska, and I had the um, pleasure and honor of working with a group of people um, on a project on sea otters in Southeast Alaska over the last five or seven years, I guess. Um, the PhD student named Zach Hoyt, uh, Verena Gill with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and Ginny Eckert with the School of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences. And, and we were looking at what might be called the case of the rapidly reappearing sea otters and um, what that means for, what that has meant for Southeast Alaska. So if we can go to the next slide. 
this shows us um, what you, well, let's see, sea otters were extinct in Southeast Alaska by 1911. And we had a large gap of time there before, uh, with no sea otters in, in, in our area. Our, our study area was Southern Southeast Alaska. So it was the area that was bounded, that's bounded here in this map. So you can see from, from the Southern end of Prince of Wales Island up to Frederick Sound on the North side. So the information that I'm gonna present to you is all just for Southern Southeast Alaska. But, um, if you see the, the dark circles there on the maps, one at the southern end of Prince of Wales and one about halfway up, um, that's where uh, sea otters were reintroduced by the Department of Fish and Game in 1968. And there were 106 otters reintroduced there. Since then, uh, the population in Southeast Alaska has grown um, considerably, just like what we were hearing about in Kachemak Bay, uh, an average rate of 12% per year. So that in 2010, we had uh, just over 13,000 animals uh, on a fish and wildlife survey. So from the original 106 that were translocated, we now have um, 13,000. At the same time, those populations didn't just stay where they were located. The, the range and the area that the population covered has also expanded. And that's actually averaged out over time to 117 square kilometers per year. And so this map shows you how that expansion has occurred. So there's the circle in about the center and the circle down at the bottom where they were relocated in 1968. And then you'll see the darker orange doesn't change much with that southern population. But if you look at that northern population, it grew expanded a bit to the north and west, and also all the way out to Coronation Island. So that's the island farthest out there that's bounded by that darker orange. And I'm gonna come back to that one in a minute, so I wanted to point that out. So then by 1988, they've expanded into the lighter orange. And again, you see in southern, in the southern population wasn't moving too much, but we're starting to see pretty quick um, movement in the northern part. So 1994 is the yellow, that population continues northward into Kuyu Island and that big Bay on the outside of Kuyu Island is Tebenkoff Bay. Um, again, the population down at the south hasn't changed too much, and it's not until the 2000s. The lighter green is 2003, the medium green is 2010, and the darker green is 2014. It shows how that population has expanded. So that southern population started to really grow there in the early 2000s, whereas the northern, that northern reintroduction group, I guess, um, has expanded quite a bit in that amount of time and a little bit more evenly over time. So if we can go to the next slide. At the same time, um, in Southeast Alaska, we had that long gap between the time when the otters were hunted for their, you know, hunted out by their fur and the time when they, their population started to really grow. We had some commercial fisheries develop in Southern Southeast Alaska that targeted some of their favorite species. So. Um, the value of these four species together in 2013 was $16.9 million. So we've got Dungeness crab, red sea urchin, California sea cucumber, cucumber and guiduck clams. The uh, Dungeness crab are caught with, trab, with crab pots or traps, and the urchins, clams, and sea cucumbers are harvested through dive fisheries. So if you can go to the next slide. You can imagine this sort of classic food train where the otters are eating the sea urchins and the sea urchins are eating the kelp. Um, in the meantime, in the absence of otters, you get a lot of sea urchins. And if we were to draw a human into this food chain, maybe with an arrow going towards that sea urchin, you can imagine how um, perhaps some conflict has risen between those sea otters and the human beings that are making a living off of those sea urchins and other invertebrates. So if we can go to the next slide. So the, the reason for this project, uh, at the time, Zach Hoyt was working for the Department of Fish and Game managing those dive fisheries, uh, which were for the, um, everything but the Dungeness crab. And I, and I work here in a very f uh, commercial fishing dependent community of Petersburg, both hearing concerns expressed by commercial fishermen that um, places that they used to be able to harvest their target species, they weren't able to find those species anymore. And they were saying, they saw sea otters come in, you know, the next time they went to try to harvest their species in that area, there weren't any more to be harvested. And, you know, uh, people weren't having very positive feelings about sea otters, I guess we should say. So the goal of the project was really to try to um, give some scientific uh, information to help inform the discussions about about this issue. And so um, what, one of the first things that Zach did primarily through some really incredible field work 
was to, to assess the, the diet of otters in southern southeast at the population level. So he observed 6,117 individual dives by otters and, and examined what they were bringing to the surface to eat. And uh, this graph here shows uh, the, the species that were observed being eaten on the x-axis and on the y-axis is uh, the contribution to that, uh, that population level diet and that's biomass, so not individuals, but um, the actual grams of product that is eaten by those otters. So the species on the left-hand side in capital and bold are the commercial species, commercially harvested species, and then those on the right are uh, not commercially harvested, although they are definitely, um, especially clams and many of the others are harvested for subsistence and personal use. And um, Ginny's actually, Ginny Eckert's gonna be continuing some work starting to look at those subsistence uses by humans, but uh, the focus of our project was the commercial species. So overall in Southeast Alaska, 46% of the sea otter diet are species that are also important to commercial fishermen. But we were, Zach, I would, should say, went to a bit more detail. And if we can move to the next slide, this one's a little complicated, but hopefully I can help explain it. Um, that's not equal uh, across the entire region. And, it, and, and they found that it depends on how long the otters had been in an area. So if you look at the upper arrow on the map there, that's pointing to Coronation Island, which I pointed out earlier, which was er recolonized early uh, since reintroduction. And then the diet for the, for the otters that were observed in that area is in the, the bar graph at the very top. So you can see that's a pretty diverse diet. There's um, quite a bit of fish. We have shrimps, small crabs, other mollusks, clams, mussels, and gooey duck clams. So of those, the gooey duck clams are um, commercially important, but there's a, a big diversity. Whereas if you look at the lower arrow, that's pointing to Outer Doll Island there at the southern end of Prince of Wales Island, where otters have just moved, and the diet is almost exclusively red urchins. And so what Zach saw over the, over the broad scale was that um, when otters first colonized a new area, they targeted commercial species such as red sea urchins and dungeness crab. So in some ways, uh, we were able to show that what we were hearing from the fishermen and the, resource, and the commercial resource users was confirmed by what we saw, that, that as the otters moved into a new bay, they probably were likely targeting the commercially important species first. They're easy, you go grab a sea cucumber off the bottom. But as they were in an area longer, that diet became more diverse. So if you can go to the next slide. So very briefly, and uh, Angie touched on this a little bit, um, what Zach had the pleasure of doing and I did as well was to spend some time figuring out uh, how, how to figure out what they were eating. And they, they bring their, what they consume to the surface so you can measure uh, the size of the critter that it's eating based on uh, the size of the otter paw. So an average otter paw, as you see there, is 50 millimeters. And so you would, they would identify the diet item by how many paws it was, a one paw, one and a half paw, or a two paw, and then as best as they could identify it down to species. So that was some pretty um, fun field work to be able to participate in. And then if we can go to the next slide. I was also able to go out, um, Zach tagged several otters up near Cake at the northern edge of the range where the expansion is still going on um, to see how the otters were moving. And uh, the way that you do this is by actually having a tangled net. So somewhat like a commercial gill net uh, that people might be familiar with. And then the otters, you wait around until they swim into the net. They um, were tagged. You can see that otter's flipper there on the other side of the line um, has been tagged. So this guy actually was captured, tagged, had a radio transmitter implanted. Um, and then was re-released and then swam back into the net again. So he obviously wanted to be caught, I guess. <laughs> uh, but then if we can go to the next slide. We actually spent quite a bit of time catching seaweed and kelp um, <laughs> and uh, spent a lot of time digging that out of there, which was fun. We, 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 learnt, we honed our fishing skills as the couple of weeks went by. But um, I wanted to put this picture here because the gal in the yellow rain gear there, her name is Joanne Day, and she's a middle school teacher with the Petersburg Middle School here. And we were able to take her out for a week of our two-week project, Capturing Otters. And as part of her program, she actually wrote a, a curriculum unit 
um, revising in some ways the curriculum unit that we already have with the seas and watersheds curriculum, but um, making it specific to Southeast Alaska and talking about bringing humans into that population and having them exploit the same resources that the otters are. And so that should be a pretty neat resource for people. I wanted to point you out to that. And you can also, on that same web page, there's a whole description of what that otter capture process was as well. So that's going to do it for me, and I'm available for questions if people want to email me, um, and I can give you as much information as I can and pass on Zach's dissertation to you if you want to dig into the, de the details there. Thank you very much, Sunny. Um, we have a few minutes in case there are questions now to unmute and then go ahead. And I had, a, I had a question. Go ahead, Marilyn. Yeah, I, I had a question. Uh, since, Angie, you've worked in the Aleutians and, and also Catchmack Bay, uh, could you just give a brief update about what, what has happened with the uh, populations there in the Aleutians? Um, I have been, I've still been doing some survey work, usually as vacation out there, because I'm kind of an Aleutian junkie. <laughs> um, the, they're still in the emergency room. You know, there's the, the densities are uniformly low. Um, I'm pleased to say that none of the island groups have lost their island or otter population entirely, but densities are very low. Um, one of the, the big joys I had last year um, on, on Alaska, we saw some actually big groups. We saw a group of 40, and then we saw a group of 80, and we hadn't seen that in the Aleutians for since the mid 80s now. So, you know, that's, that's actually pretty cool. Um, so maybe some areas are, are coming back a little stronger. I, I, if I, if I can swing it, I'll probably go out and finish the, um, an Alaska surveys with the maritime folks this, this summer again. So, you know, that, that was really encouraging to me. Um, so I think the two things that are encouraging is we haven't lost them in all island groups. I think there's still a, um, a very big concern. I don't think that they're a functional part of the ecosystem for many of the islands in, in the Aleutian chain. Um, not a whole lot of survey data for the South Alaska Peninsula Islands, North Alaska Peninsula since the, since the listing actually. So that's still kind of a, data, a very big data gap. Um, the Kodiak Archipelago was surveyed in 2014 by the refuge there. Um, it hasn't it's not, it's not significantly different from its 1994 surveys, though. So unlike the lower Cook Inlet Catchmack Bay area that was growing by maybe 13% per year during that same time frame, a lot, the Kodiak Archipelago is pretty, um, you know, numerically equivalent. Um, and so um, I'm, and I think that's somewhere between 11 and 13,000 animals for the whole archipelago. Um, the lower Cook Inlet uh, Catchmack Bay area is probably close to, you know, somewhere in equilibrium density now, but again, we're needing more survey data on that. Does that help? Yes, thanks. Um, and one last question. Um, are, are you seeing, or are the people who are doing surveys out in the Aleutian seeing the recovery of the kelp beds, or is that anything changing with that relationship? Um... I don't know the answer to that, actually. Um, I don't know. I think there's some really good, um, they've re uh, implemented some historical dive surveys that Jim Estes and crew started actually in the 70s. And um, Christy Croker and um, some of her students are taking on getting, getting back to that and sampling urchins and looking at urchin health and dynamics and almost more from an ocean acidification standpoint, because that's another reason why you might lose your urchins. And you might have more kelp, but you still might not have your otters back. So. Thank you very much, Angie, Marilyn, and Sunny. Um, it's time to turn the program over to Beth Trowbridge. Hi, um, I'm Beth Trowbridge, and I have been working with Marilyn Sigmund to help uh, facilitate some of the teacher workshops that have gone along with the Alaska Season Watersheds curriculum. And what I wanted to do right now is to just take a few minutes to 
go through the curriculum and show the teachers that are participating in this webinar some options that um, you might have for using some of these activities to teach about some of the information and concepts that you heard today, um, even if you weren't doing Unit 4. So uh, what I'd like to do is just kind of walk you through uh, the different grade levels um, and show you some activities that could relate either to the subject area of sea otters and what they eat or the concepts of food webs, um, you know, human interactions and that, that sort of thing. Remembering too that the seas and watersheds curriculum is divided up into grade bands, as you can see on the slide with K2 and uh, 3, 5, and 6, 8, to encourage teachers to um, explore some in the different levels and not just go to their, their grade level to look for activities because there's a lot of ones that can be used um, at, at many different levels. So we can go on to the next slide. We'll start with grade one, um, plants and animals of seas and rivers. And in this particular grade, I picked a couple activities that I think um, would be great for uh, grade one teachers as well as some of the other, uh, other elementary age teachers. Um, in particular, this uh, activity 1C that is in investigation one that just looks at biologists and um, what they use for investigating. So you've just met two different scientists, you've learned about some of the jobs that they've done, you can pass it on to your students and they can start to explore what is a marine biologist, what kind of tools do they use to solve problems, and just starting to look at some of those um, different ways that scientists investigate questions and things that they um, want to know. This unit also has some great activities for exploring more about the specific uh, marine invertebrates that were talked about in this uh, in this webinar, as well as um, doing some little mini research projects to um, to look at more specifically at those um, invertebrates that the sea otters do eat, and um, has some actually some great handouts for looking at life cycles. So if you wanted to investigate, you've learned about the sea urchins that are a main food of the sea otters. If you wanted to investigate um, their life cycles and, and learn a little bit more about that, then um, you, know, you can look at one of the investigations that actually has life cycle stages cards that go with it and um, do a little mini research project. You can go on to the next slide. Oh, I went ahead, I guess. So that's what um, this one shows. These are the plant and animal research and the life cycle wheels. So again, you're learning about, you just learned a lot about the sea otter life cycle. And here you can look, learn about some of the life cycles of the actual marine invertebrates that they're eating and some of the um, ways that that, that that affects their health and the health of um, the ecosystem. Okay, next slide. In grade two, um, you're, that's primarily focused on being at home in the water. So here you're looking at who lives where and why. And so again, you can have your students do a little bit more uh, detailed investigation into the marine, uh, marine invertebrates. There's a great activity called Let's Meet the Invertebrates, and which, which allows you to have your students do um, a particular research project on um, on these invertebrates and learn about what they eat, where they live, um, what are their predators, many of the things that were just talked about uh, with the sea otters. So you can take what you've learned in this webinar and use that as a, um, as a story to tell to get your students motivated to learn about either animals that are involved in this sea otter story or ones that are in their you know, backyard. Okay, next slide. Grade three, um, this particular unit does uh, focus on watersheds and salmon primarily, but there's still some activities that can be um, tied into and connected to uh, what you were learning about in this webinar. So again, looking at the concepts of um, how uh, animals use their environment, what's a healthy environment for them, how, uh, how they, they are able to go through their life cycles. So you can, if you're learning about salmon, you can make the correlation between uh, the salmon life cycle stages and the marine invertebrate life cycle stages, what they need to be uh, food, water, shelter, what they need to survive as um, compared to what the sea otters needed to survive. So you can have some of those um, crossovers in using this particular unit. The fish finder activity is another great activity to look a little bit, get your students to look more closely at their own local environment, much like Again, using the scientists that you've heard from in this particular webinar 
seeing, um, hearing about some of the ways that they investigated the sea otter stories, what they had to do in order to try to problem solve and, and learn and have the students look more closely at their environment and um, start to ask questions and figure out what's going on in their own environment. We're skipping, you can go to the next slide. We're skipping grade four because that's what this whole webinar is about. So we're gonna move on to grade five. And here in grade five, this is where um, uh, the activities really start to focus a lot on the human interactions or humans and the ocean and how they interact with the ocean. And there's a couple really um, great activities um, that really parallel the sea otter story. One is the Badarki story that's highlighted here, the legend of the Badarki. And again, this one is one that um, it parallels because it involves looking at how scientists and the local uh, community work together to try to solve a problem with the resource that they had. And um, while this one focuses, you know, primarily on the chitons that are found in Kachemak Bay and one of the communities here, you can use that story to just, again, look at how scientists and, and, the, and locals are working together to try to solve a problem. And they had to um, use both the scientific um, research and um, knowledge of life cycles and, and scientific processes along with what the locals were observing about changes in their environment and, and uh, subsistence uses and human uses. They had to work together to solve the problem of what was happening with these chitons over time. So it's a good parallel um, to what you were just hearing with the sea otter story and um, human impacts on the sea otters. Go to the next slide. <clears throat> Um, so in, okay, so in grade six, uh, you're looking a little bit more about uh, exploring the ocean, and here's where we, um, you'll find more activities that have to do with uh, technology and um, using technology to help uh, solve a problem. So some of the, um, some of the things that both Angie and Sunny talked about in terms of tools that they use to try to, um, you know, measure health and uh, population statistics, uh, interactions, these are things that students are going to be exposed to in this particular grade where they're going to learn what are those tools that scientists are using to actually explore what's going on in the ocean. And again, exploring your local waters, is, it's working with students to understand some of the scientific processes that have to go on in order to um, solve a problem. So they get introduced to sampling, um, you know, keeping science notebooks, trying to record some of the data to get to some of the information that was presented to you in this webinar, or if they were going to be, if they were going to understand some of the scientific processes, then they would know um, how to go about using those tools to try to get to some of those answers. Okay, and moving on to seven, ocean in motion. So um, one of the uh, I think one of the best activities in this particular unit is looking at where did the rubber bath toys go. And um, so while this particular lesson does uh, focus on marine debris and the story of the rubber duckies that fell overboard, um, it again, it looks at science practices, problem solving. How did this particular study allow scientists to understand more about uh, circulations, uh, ocean circulations, and um, things like that. So the, again, you're looking at, you're trying to draw that correlation to have your students start to think about um, how do you ask a question? You have a problem like the sea otter population disappearing or recovering. You have that situation. How are you going to go about designing um, an investigation that helps you answer that question? And so this is a great um, kind of hands-on story that allows them to see that process in action. And the last slide for grade eight, um, our changing world focuses a lot on um, climate change and environmental change. And in this particular grade uh, level, you have the activity of the Bering Sea Expedition or investigating the Bering Sea Expedition, which specifically looks at how um, changes in the environment are affecting the uh, food webs of the Bering Sea. So that's a direct correlation to you know, what's been happening with the sea otters um, in the, down in the southeast or out on the Aleutians. You know, they're asking some of the same questions. And so this particular activity would be a great, um, a great one to do 
using the information that you just learned in this webinar um, as an example, as a kickoff story, as a way to get your students excited about um, looking at uh, another example of scientists investigating changes in the in their environment and how that affects those animals that are living there, plants and animals that are living there. And I think that that is my last slide. Yes. So I would be, um, uh, one of my goals, sorry, I'm breaking into Marilyn's time a little bit, but one of my goals was just to highlight some of the activities that you can find in the Season Watersheds curriculum and just to really encourage you to, to look through the activities. There's a lot of um, gems in there. There's a lot of uh, great research, field trips, um, exploration. So just trying to go ahead and um, take some time to look through and find activities that will be relevant, you know, relevant to you in your, in your class. Thank you very much, Beth. And we will now turn uh, the presentation over to Marilyn Sigmund. Uh, I need to break in. Marilyn, you need to unmute uh, your uh, audio. Here you go. Okay. All right. I wanted to um, pr provide a few more teaching tips. Uh, we're all kind of in the process right now of trying to realign uh, different activities in Alaska with the next generation science standards, which are new. And things have moved around a little bit in terms of where the content really fits. So um, we're going to take a quick look at how this particular unit fits with what is now recommended by next generation science standards for grade level appropriateness and talk just a little bit about relevance to place-based education which a lot of schools are embracing and school districts are embracing in Alaska. Next slide please. So next generation science standards are very different in the way they approach teaching. They have both content pieces in the, what they call the core ideas and the cross-cutting concepts. They also focus on practices, which are both engineering practices, and what we think of in science and in the Alaska State Science Standards is science process skills. And I found one of the best ways to, to kind of get your, your head around thinking this way as planning your instruction is to use what is called a phenomena to anchor your instruction. And phenomena are something in, often in your local environment that is very familiar to your students and very tangible, and a lot of different um, things can be uh, used. It can guide instruction a lot of different concepts. So next slide, please. So sea otters are a really good example of what can be a uh, anchoring phenomenon, because as this uh, illustration shows you in a food web, they're, they're connected to so many different things, any one of which might have a, a different concept like life cycles or the food web itself, but they're also connected with the physical environment and some of the impacts of changing chemistry through ocean acidification, through uh, changing water temperatures. And as we heard um, from Sunny, they're, they're connected with, to humans. There's competition for resources. So they're a really good example of how you could teach a variety of concepts, as you heard um, Beth mentioned, through, through the, the curricula that we have in Alaska Season Watersheds. Next, please. So I'm going to go real quickly through the three parts of the Next Generation Science Standards. I wanted to just locate where the concepts are in grades three through five. And I think for the disciplinary core ideas, which is the content, um, I think that the food web uh, focus that's um, in this unit now fits really well with grade three through five because food webs and food chains are in fact one of the performance expectations of students that they'll be able to describe food webs essentially and how matter moves among the different levels. Um, and yet there's a lot too about uh, populations and how populations get the resources. That now is actually over in middle school that might be a little advanced for, that might be covered better in middle school than in, in grades um, three through five. And uh, next, please. And I also, when you look at the cross-cutting concepts, the other piece of content, I think um, we're kind of right on by, by focusing on systems and system models and how the components in the systems interact. It's a really good science story to illustrate that. Younger grades are more focused on patterns and middle school is more focused on cause and effect, stability and change. And that's a pretty sophisticated part of this unit, trying to figure out if 
killer whales really are the cause of the sea otter decline. So again, that might be a little advanced according to the NGSS for the grades three through five. Next, please. And um, in terms of the practices, I think looking at issues like the ones uh, that uh, Sunny described, and there's others in, even in Catchmack Bay, is something that grade, uh, students in this grade level could really take on and try to find out about a local issue. But in terms of actually trying to solve it, I think um, it's a little too difficult for grades K through two to try to come up with a solution. If there's a conflict between people, uh, might be very controversial in a community. And if middle school students could actually though get involved in um, designing methods to go out and collect data, maybe watching otters eat what they eat, that would be a real good middle school kind of activity. Uh, next, please. So coming back to um, this, this system, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about place-based education because it's something that Alaska Seas and Watershed certainly promotes and we're, we try to make everything Alaska relevant. But uh, what I hear from people sometimes, if you don't have sea otters, is this unit even relevant to you? And I guess I would just uh, say for that is that um, you, you need to make that decision, of course, in terms of is it such a charismatic, engaging species that it's going to engage your students? Um, how place-based, you know, does place-based education really need to be? Is Alaska specific enough? And will they be interested enough uh, for that? Um, you might decide that in trying in picking a phenomena that where you can take the very same concepts, including some of the conflicts that might be happening in your community over resources, that you might want to choose another species that, that's more relevant and, and, um, and do some your own research on some of the background information on that species. So in closing, I'd just like to mention we're going to be updating the teaching activities and the background sections in this unit so we can incorporate some of what you heard in the webinar. If you do adapt a, a unit, um, this unit for your grade level or your place or for the next generation science standards, I'd love to get copies of your lesson plans and resources. And with your permission, we'll post them on the website and share them among other teachers who are using these resources. Uh, and last, I just one more time, give you some information about if you do have questions, Angie and Sunny have both agreed to answer your questions until May 15, 2016 by email. Um, if you're watching this webinar much later than that date, uh, please send those questions to me and I will send them on and, and, and probably get some answers for you um, or from someone else. And if you, again, if you have things um, that you're doing that are adapting these units, um, please send them to me. My email is at the bottom of this slide. And that I think we are done. Thank you, Marilyn, and thank you everyone for joining us.